Okay, so good morning, Kim. Good morning. You are sitting where at the moment? I'm currently sitting in Silgeborg in Denmark. Uh, we have a, I guess, a small institute, a part of the Technical University of Denmark, out here, sort of in the country, closer to, to nature. So we're, this is where I'm sitting right now, today. We have a strong attachment to fresh water. I do. So why do. did you end up in Denmark? It's more the marine country. Yeah, uh, that's kind of a funny story. Uh, my background is not really in um, freshwater or conservation in particular. I actually did my undergrad in animal physiology and then chose to go with fish. And uh, during my master's, my research, the research questions we had actually led me to Denmark uh, to collaborate with people from Denmark. And I just fell in love with it, fell in love with the country, the, the lifestyle, uh, the nature here. So I decided to come do my PhD. And that's where um, I really sort of focused on, on freshwater and freshwater conservation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's come to the, to the main issue today. Uh, we're mainly talking about dam removal, river restoration, how to get freshwater ecosystems into a better shape again. So that's the main reason why these interviews are taking place. Yeah. Um, what is your touch point um, and your connection to, um, to dam removal, river restoration, uh, to the movement? My connection? Um... Well, I'm in a place uh, that supports dam removal quite a bit. Uh, I was lucky to have mentors that uh, sort of took it upon themselves to change part of the legislation here um, in Denmark. And um, I think this is kind of where my PhD came in. I, I investigated the effects of dams and barriers, uh, big and small, uh, but in particular, the effects of removing them. And when you see sort of a river come back to life, um, I mean, it, it's impressive and it, and it just, it really doesn't take much, just removing that barrier and nature will, will do its thing. Um, so I think I was convinced of course, by the scientific evidence, but also from my own experience, from my own eyes, uh, having seen it happen. And I was lucky enough to have um, monitored, I think 22 uh, barrier removals uh, over the last three years. So we freed about 310 kilometers of river. And I think in Denmark for such a small country, that's uh, it's rather good. This is kind of where my involvement with dam removal started. Uh, of course, I'm passionate just about freshwater and freshwater conservation because they're so overlooked uh, and undervalued. You, you said that uh, freshwater ecosystems are overlooked and mm -hmm. you're using a hashtag on Twitter, which says freshwater needs love too. Mm -hmm. So maybe yeah. we could go into that before we come to the concrete examples in Denmark. Maybe th this seems to be your, your mission a little bit to get the fresh yeah, water. Yeah, it is. I think uh, when when we work with fresh water, we're, we're in it. So we don't really notice that it's actually overlooked because that's what you work with. But when you look at the science, uh, just at the number of, of papers published on freshwater conservation versus marine or terrestrial conservation, the numbers are widely different. I mean, it's it's a, a completely different scale. Um, they're yeah, they're they're overlooked people. If you just talk to the public when they think of wildlife and and uh, charismatic fauna, they don't think of freshwater unless they're anglers. Um, but they think of you know the African savannas or coral reefs or so freshwater, I think is overlooked uh, by scientists. Uh, there's a lot more people going into marine biology or even terrestrial biology. Um, but it's also overlooked, I think, uh, by, by the public, by, by the way we communicate it, by uh, the way we involve people or engage people to, to want to protect freshwater or to even know anything. I think freshwaters are typically viewed as um, sort of a commodity, something that we can use for drinking water or for washing your clothes and that sort of thing, but not as a biodiversity hotspot, which is actually what they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what, what 
Could you give us a little bit of an idea why freshwater ecosystems are so important also for humans globally? Do, 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 you, have, do you have a very interesting Twitter thread um, <laughs> about freshwater and why they should be loved more? Yes. Uh, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about why they count and yeah. why they should not be overlooked anymore. And also, in Europe, there is a new biodiversity strategy just under development. There was a proposal presented by the European Commission in May, and now there's all kinds of, uh, of committees and working groups working on that. Uh, and one of the aims is to protect 10% of the marine and terrestrial ecosystems of Europe. Where's the freshwater there? Yeah. Yeah, um, there is a part of that thread on Twitter that uh, just has a figure from the IUCN, which is literally the the sort of the organization that's supposed to be representative of conservation and, and issues with biodiversity. And they've measured, you know, the decline in all sorts of taxa and there are zero freshwater um, species in there. So they're they're not even put in in sort of those advertisements that are supposed to call people to want to do something about it. So that's really frustrating. But um, if we're talking about why we should care, well, if you look at sort of the planet as a whole, uh, freshwaters cover about two point three percent of the surface, and it, they represent about zero point zero one percent of all water on Earth. Yet there's nine point five percent of species that live in freshwater and about 55% of fish, I'm a fish biologist, 55% um, of fish that actually depend on freshwater for at least one part of, of their life cycle. So if you consider how small of a proportion of the planet they are and how much um, biodiversity are in there, it's actually, they are hotspots. So, and, and we we need to to protect them and I think, this is where the link to dam removal comes in is dams and, and barriers to connectivity, barriers to movement and, and their impacts on habitats are probably one of the main, if not the main um, culprit for, for this decline, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're talking about dam removal and uh, Denmark is kind of an interesting country in that aspect. Uh, there have been a lot of removals and there is a strong movement. Um, maybe we could go into that uh, thing a little bit now. Uh, when talking about dam removals, what, what should be the, the priorities? Where to start? Is there any strategy for uh, restoration of rivers? What, what's, what's your impression? I mean, ideally there would be a strategy, but uh, life sometimes makes it that that's a bit difficult. Um, ideally, if we want to get the most sort of bang for our buck, we would want to remove the barriers that have the biggest impact. The problem with that is that the barriers that have the biggest impact are usually the ones that have the biggest um, sort of uh, opposing sides. Uh, they're also the ones perhaps that uh, provide electricity for um, a lot of people, but we also don't evaluate the consequences of each barrier. So if if we're talking about you know which barrier poses the biggest threat in terms of movement or or passage, we don't actually have you know telemetry studies or something that will evaluate this problem at that specific location everywhere. So this makes it that we. I mean, we can try and rank the, the barriers in terms of which one we should remove, but that's it's a bit difficult. So in Denmark, they've adopted kind of a do what you can uh, mm -hmm. strategy. And sometimes that means that you just remove a barrier that's maybe smaller or less impactful because you have the money to remove that one, but not the slightly biggest one that's downstream. Um, there's also the way that it works in Denmark is uh, a lot of them are privately owned. A lot of the barriers, they're small weirs, often with fish farms um, or sort of, yeah, uh, old mills or, so they're old and, and they're privately owned, which means that we essentially will pay the owner to remove it. Um, so the cost of removals are much, much, much higher in Denmark, but it gets the job done because Essentially, if you have the money, you can just remove it. And that's kind of the strategy um, that they've adopted is just remove whatever you can, wherever you can, 
um, when when you have the funds to do it. So sometimes that means we don't remove the one we'd like to remove, which is unfortunate, but it's kind of a one step at a time. You know, at some point there might be a little more money. Okay, we can remove a more significant one. Yeah. yeah. And what is the public perception? Because I live in Austria. Yeah, Austria is full of hydropower plants and all sorts of dams and barriers, uh, thousands of them. Uh, and Austria is proud that most of the electricity is coming from renewable energy and most of that is from hydro. Uh, so there is a very positive public mood about hydro. Mm -hmm. At the same time, constructing new dams was a big issue, but now uh, lots of small hydro uh, plants came up, which are a bit more cozy, they're not so big, they don't look so ugly, and there are thousands of them. But uh, they, of, of course, they're causing tremendous damage to the rivers here. But the public opinion still is very much that this is kind of a green energy source. So therefore, because of climate change, and also the industry is following that spin. But how's the situation in Denmark? In terms of the public perception, that varies. We have a very strong um, angling community, uh, freshwater angling as well. So I think the fishermen are quite... Um, active in in restoring rivers so it's not just dam removal but just um, restoration so putting gravel so you can have spawning uh, reds for salmon is that sort of thing um, in the big places so the 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 part the, the biggest dams that we have here in Denmark mind you are quite small compared to most dams that we're talking about but then then the public perception is that this is the best thing. Um, and it's, yeah, I think, I think it, it varies. It really does. I removed dams at fish farms. Um, and there were some fish farmers that we talked to who essentially switched their fish farms into, um, like a recirculating system. So they don't have to shut down. It's just about reorganizing things. There is a cost to that. Um, but they're really happy with what they're seeing in the river. So when we go and sample and, and show them what we've done, um, they're all they're always there. They're always always really excited. They really they they email us to ask for the graphs to show how much the population is increasing. And then you go to other places where people don't show up, they don't care, they just they don't they don't really see the point. Um, so the opinions will uh, vary. I can think of a specific place here where um, there's a big dam. Uh, it's called Tanya. And in our opinion, and it's not just my opinion, but it, I can speak for some of my colleagues as well. It's, it's our biggest uh, failure in terms of freshwater. It wiped out the only um, eastern migrating population of Atlantic salmon. So now the salmon that are in that, that, um, that system are just stocked. Um, the, the sea trout population went down, uh, incredibly. And, um, all of this is essentially because upstream of the dam, you now have Lake Tanya. It's not a lake, it's a reservoir, but it's called Lake Tanya. And so there's a community there that, you know, they've seen this lake for a long time. Uh, there's, there's boating, there's houses being sold with a lake view. All of this has impacts. Um, and, and they've tried to offer solutions um to shut down the dam and just you know keep the lake there but but make the river sort of go next to it um and everything is just completely shut down they have made a group called um friends of lake tanya or Fr friends of dams or something like that um so so yeah all of that to say, I guess it's going to vary it's not an easy issue and and the bigger the dam or the more uh, sort of secondary impacts it has on the community, the harder it is going to be to to remove it. And mind you, this dam provides electricity for, you know, only a couple thousand households. It's really not much. You could replace it with just one one windmill, um, and they they just kind of refuse to acknowledge that. So, mm -hmm. I mean. In many countries in Europe, uh, the fight is not so much about removing dams, but preventing new ones, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Eastern Europe, Austria, in Balkans, that 3,000 yep. dams plan, which is which is kind of a nightmare because the rivers there are among the best we still have in Europe. Um, 
how's the situation in Denmark? Is there is there still a pressure coming from industry to build more dams, or are, are you switched over to the removal debate largely? That's a good question. I don't know if there's a push to build new ones. I honestly don't think so. What I've been told is that none have been built since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the push is, and it is in the legislation, that that removal should be um, the first option. So we've worked, uh, Denmark is split into about 100 municipalities. So we've worked with the local municipalities and, and that's what they try to do is, is remove barriers and every year they get some money from the government so they look at what barriers they can remove with that um yeah so i think i think um there isn't much of a push denmark is really flat so so there's not much power that you can get from water um because we're just a a, a flat country we have low gradient rivers so hydro is not very profitable uh, in comparison to to most other countries in Europe, at least. So uh, solar and wind are maybe what's growing more here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, there's some more than ten thousand barriers have been removed in Denmark since the nineteen sixties, which is which is incredible. <laughs> I think in Austria, not not one has been removed in the last year. Um, is uh, so it seems that this is kind of a best practice thing, but other countries in Europe could learn a lot. What is your, let's say, message to the other countries and to the movement? How, what, what is kind of a recipe? How to, how to get a positive mood about removing dams? Mm. And uh, so, so what, what, what the movement could learn from Denmark in order to get their dams away as well? That's a good question. I think in Denmark we're lucky because we're a bit smaller and because hydro isn't such a big thing. So in that sense, the job has maybe been easier and it's it's still not easy. And like I said, most of the barriers that have been removed are not hydro dams. There are small weirs associated with fish farms and maybe that, that practice is becoming less profitable. I don't know. Um, my message would be that I guess you have to start somewhere and you need to push for those those things, dam removal as a first option to be in the legislation. Um, I think too often the industry, so electricity, hydroelectricity, there's so much money involved that they always win. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't think I have a solution that's gonna work everywhere, but I do know that the the public opinion does matter. So they, they've they stopped a dam being built um, in a, a Natura 2000 site in Spain that was part of the AMBER project. And that was a lot about the people opposing it. So I think if we can teach the public, if we can teach people, if we can educate them about fresh water, what they offer, how important they are, I think if we can get the public on our side, um, that that would would make it easier um, to, to try and enact some of those removals. And I think Dam Removal Europe is doing a great job of that. Uh, it's one step at a time. It, that's essentially what it is. And I think if you can show in your own country what the effects of a removal can be, that that helps a lot as well. Um, because it's one thing for them to see that and hear about that in Denmark, uh, but maybe it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like it would be the same um, in their own communities. So, yeah, I would I would maybe try that. I think we talked a little bit uh, before about the EU Water Framework Directive and how it's just not specific enough, it's not demanding enough, and essentially people can get away with a whole lot. So if we can change the legislation uh, so that people can't get away with it, I think that would be a solid step forward as well. Mm -hmm. What are because I think that that could be an interesting point also for the viewers. What what are the main weaknesses of the water framework directive to your according to your opinion? What what should be fixed there? What what are the loopholes? I think um, it's not very specific in what actually qualifies as a good uh, condition for a river. You know, a good quality of a river. It's not defined uh, or it's not well defined, and I think. Um, one of the major things is that if a river is already sort of heavily modified, 
it essentially doesn't have to make any changes because it's already heavily modified. And I think a lot of countries have tried to get a lot of their rivers qualified as heavily modified because then they don't have to do anything. Um, and that's, that's a problem. It shouldn't be that easy. Um, I mean, because your, your river is screwed up, I shouldn't have to do anything. No, you should try and fix it. Um, so, so I think that certainly needs to be changed. I think, um, you know, in, in many countries, 95% of the electricity is created by, you know, five to 10% of the hydro dams. So those other 90% of the hydro should be removed. And, and yeah, there will be a small loss in income for electricity companies. And, and yes, some reservoirs will be taken away. And that means that people are going to lose their lakes, but this is too important. Um, it's, it's biodiversity, it's, it's water safety, it's, um, it, it's, it's important for us. Like it, it's our, it's our own survival, really. Climate change is also about that. It's, it's not just about us being able to, to, the, the planet will keep going after we're gone, but, um, but this is also about us. It's about humans and it's about, uh, you know, needing this nature, we rely on it. So if we don't take care of it, um, it's going to be gone. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that we need to be more forward, uh, more demanding because it is possible. It, it is possible to, to remove, you know, easily 50% of barriers with next to no consequences, um, for, in terms of, electricity production which is usually the argument that we get uh for for not removing them so yeah i i think that that, that in, in some countries there, there might be a problem because then removal means destruction of buildings mm -hmm. but, which were built by humans by engineers yeah uh, technical masterpieces maybe old buildings which have some historical value um and uh, I know some examples here that when talking about dam removal, people say, you want to destroy historical buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah, aggressive, this is destructive. So, so, so what worked in Denmark in order to get so much support behind this dam removal uh, issue? Is this deliberation thing, a, a liberated river, a positive picture? Did you talk about the positive sides rather than talking about the removal uh, the, what, what, the, what was the success story? Well, the cultural historic aspect is an issue, especially in Europe, because barriers have been around in Europe for much longer than, say, in North America. Um, it is an issue here. And essentially what happens in Denmark is it, if the whatever commission decides what's a cultural historic site, if they come in and they say, this barrier is a cultural historic site, forget it, we can't touch it. Um, and again, people know what they have, they don't know what they get. So they often want to have a certain barrier qualified as um, cultural historic because they don't want anything to change. Um, in Denmark, it is an issue. Uh, it's still something that we struggle with. Often in those cases, they end up having to um, settle on or, or sort of compromise on a different option, which won't be removal, but it might be to move the river to go around, let's say an old mill. So the river will go around. It's kind of like a sort of bypass. Um, and in those cases, uh, because people are often used to seeing, you know, large trout uh, jumping through sort of a fish ladder and then they end up in the lake. So they used to say, you know, the lake used to be like teeming with, with life. There was just fish jumping everywhere. And now, now that doesn't happen. And they don't quite understand that that's because their fish actually managed to get upstream to where they're supposed to be going. So again, it's kind of this, lack of education um there's one site that uh they had tried to get qualified as cultural historic and and i have a paper on there we have 30 years of data uh following that that dam and 
then they they went to argue what was it they argued there was a rare bat that lived around the ponded zone the reservoir and so we couldn't touch it um and essentially what happened was that there was one person who was um not spreading misinformation but but trying to convince other people to be on on their side uh, and keep that barrier and unfortunately it took until that person passed away because they were old uh, for us to be able to remove it because as soon as that person was gone nobody was getting the misinformation um, and we were able to remove it and it and it's unfortunate that these things have to happen uh, but it's definitely a struggle and it's something that we still struggle with I don't think that we really have a solution for dealing with cultural historic um, dams quote unquote um, so I, I think there's a way to compromise I think there's a way to keep you know, part of the building or keep the building and just, just remove that, you know, whatever's preventing the water from flowing properly. Yeah. Um, so, so you can still visit, you can turn it into a museum. There, there are ways to compromise. Uh, of course, you won't have a lake, you won't have a, a reservoir, um, but you're going to have a river back to life and, and that should count for something. Mm -hmm. Normally when, Conservationists or when scientists come up and say we need to do something for nature, for the environment, um, the majority of the population probably tends to say this is just a minority statement and we need to put our main focus on economy and this is not tradition, it's not normal to whatever remove dams or do things like that. Uh, so conservationists have to have to liaise, have to find some 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 allies to get stronger. And what was the uh, experience in Denmark? Uh, who were the social groups or sectors of society who were most helpful in order to create a public mood which is more sympathetic to the removal of that? Is it the fishermen? Is it... Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I... I mean, I, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm still quite young, so I, I wasn't there when this movement started in Denmark. Uh, but I think the fishermen were were a big part of that. I think there were good scientists here uh, that that were aware of the issues and and they acted and provided them with the right information. But I do think, yeah, that um, anglers um, uh, maybe even some support from you know there's a the Danish Center for Wild Salmon. I'm I'm not sure, but. I think they're essentially people who like fish, people who who are uh, who you know who care about fish, who care about rivers, who care about fish being in the river. Um, I think that was a a, a big thing. Uh, that's where most of the support will come from. You also have just conservationists and people that that see the value in in having nature, but um, you know we don't. In some cases, you might have support from. Um, the bird conservation groups because restoring a river might mean that you get better wetlands or it's better habitat for the bird. But in some cases, it's the opposite. We get opposing um, statements from the bird community because Makes you know removing a, a lake might remove the habitat of of some birds, but then in a way that lake again, it's a reservoir, wasn't there naturally. Um, so, so why should the birds take precedence to the fish that were actually there, um, to start off with? Mm -hmm. so, so it varies a bit, but I think anglers are a big, a big part of that. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, are there also any, any economic arguments why, uh, liberated rivers or liberated fish is beneficial for the society? There are, um, I think when you talk about removing you know, small barriers and in, in small rivers, uh, maybe less. It's a lot harder to quantify um, sort of, you know, natural income. Uh, that's very difficult to, to quantify, but they have done some work in uh, River Scam for Atlantic salmon. And essentially the whole river, it's, it's quite a large river. I think it's the second largest river in Denmark. And they they essentially restored, they, they did a lot of work to restore the whole river and restore the Atlantic salmon population. Uh, and they did it successfully. And they were able to sort of talk with anglers and see, okay, well, how much money would you be willing to spend if like 
you knew that you were going to catch salmon or if the salmon population got to this size. And, and it's quite a large income uh, for that local community, uh, you know, because when you go fishing, you might end up spending a night there. So the local hotel might be getting some money or you're going to go to the bakery the next morning um, to get coffee and breakfast. That's income for um, for the local community. And it was something like with the current um sort of population size or or that was a few years ago so what it was back then there was something like 1 million euros going directly back into that municipality and it, it's not a big municipality um and if the population were to increase to 8000 individuals so 8000 uh, spawning salmon which i think now we're at about 6000 or 7000 so it's not it's not that far off then we were almost doubling that it was like 1.7 million um, going back. So there is a, a, an, an economic argument there. And of course, that one is coming from the anglers, right? So they were asking anglers how much they'd be willing to spend to go fish, knowing that they would catch fish or um, that's not necessarily the case everywhere, but it, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's, it, it, it's somewhat similar um, in, in other places as well. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any um, so a, a final whatever wrapping up? What what uh, what are the key success factors in Denmark, and what the movement could probably also learn from the experiences in Denmark? Well, I yeah. think uh, what we can learn is that it's it it's a battle. Uh, it's not something that changed overnight here. It's a lot of people working really hard for a really long time that has led to what we have today. Um, so I would say don't don't give up, don't stop. Uh, it's it, but it, it's coming and every small win is a win. So it doesn't matter that you're removing, you know, a small barrier or the third upstream barrier in some river. Um, it's every small removal is a win. Um, I would also say that we need to care much more about freshwater. Um, there are a lot more than just drinking water. They are hot spots for biodiversity. And in Denmark, actually, our freshwaters are quite boring. It's mostly trout and salmon. Um, but if you think of the Mekong or um, the Amazon, there's so much in there. Uh, that there's probably species we haven't discovered yet, species we haven't described, and there's a chance they're going to go extinct before we can actually even find them and know that they exist. So I think it's our responsibility, uh, all of us, to to care, um, but especially for, for people who are aware of the issue, uh, freshwater conservationists and fish biologists, I think it's also our duty to, to be really loud and really passionate um, when we when we talk about freshwater, we need to inspire people to want to care, um, and that falls on us. <laughs>